Um, all right. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to the panel on Afrofuturism and Black stories and climate fiction. Um, our uh, our moderator is having trouble, <laughs> um, and for some reason isn't able. I've been I've been trying to help her troubleshoot for the last like ten minutes, um, and she's not able to get on. Uh, so uh, until uh, that gets figured out, which uh, hopefully it will, um, I am going to step in since I'm here um and and fill the shoes it's not not an ideal situation but uh we got to roll with it um so uh welcome everyone to this panel uh, my name is justine i'm uh, editor-in-chief at android press um and so i'm gonna be moderating the panel for the moment um and so uh we've got uh some great panelists this i'm really excited about uh this conversation uh that we're gonna have here um and so we'll, we'll start it off with introductions um and the really the i think the best way to do that rather than me sitting here and talking for the next few minutes at everyone um, is just to have you all introduce yourselves uh so if you want to go ahead and start uh Yvette. Uh, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Yvette Lisanzovu. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm the author of Drinking from Green Red Wells. My work um, uses a lot of Afro surrealism, uh, Afro fantasy, magical realism to explore the lives of African women. And I guess I'll popcorn it to LP. Hey, all, I'm L.P. Kindred. Um, I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, Chicago, I'm Angelino, co-co-founder at Voodoo Nuts, and you, you can find my fiction in a lot of places. And Yvette's the co-founder. Co-co-founder? Co-founder. Yeah. Popco or Nero, but open a trailer. I don't think we can hear you, unless it's my side. Yeah, I can't hear you either. Okay. Yeah, you're not. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'm an African speculative fiction writer from Nigeria. Uh, writer, editor, publisher, slush reader, and the uh, general organizer. Um, I mean, I'm a fan of literary, especially the speculative and propelling it forward, however we can do that. And I'm um, especially interested in um, Blackness, Africa, and, you know, yeah, that's me. Great, all set then. Um, all right, so uh, let's dive into the panel. Um, so, and, and let's start just by uh, having a, a discussion about, I think, the terms, um, just to kind of make sure we're all on the page, right? I think many people are familiar, to some extent at least, with the term Afrofuturism, um, but then there's also the term African Futurism, um, which I think is a, is a much newer phrase uh, coined by Nnedi uh, Okorafor, um, like 2018 or 2019. Um, so how would you define these two terms? Like how are, what's the difference between them? Um, LP, do you want to start us off? Yeah, uh, Afrofuturism and African futurism, I think for me have a lot of, uh, interplay. Um, I think the, the, the way that African futurism is used here, uh, kind of, points a light at the fact that, you know, Eurocentric, uh, sorry, uh, Anglophone publishing and its proximity to, uh, the way that being Anglophone creates proximity to publishing. Uh, so on the one side, like so much of Afrofuturism because of that, that proximity is Black American centered. And so African Futurism places the conversation more on the continent and people from the continent. And uh, I think that's kind of like a 
one level response, but I am not from the continent. So I'm gonna pass it to this brother or sister to see if they have more insight than I do, because they definitely have, because I might not have the range. I'm gonna throw it. Uh, no, I'll prefer if Yvette goes first. Uh, sure. Yeah, like LP says, uh, African futurism centers, um, you know, black mythology, history and culture uh, and center stories from the continent. Whereas African, uh, whereas Afrofuturism uh, centers both, um, you know, the continent and the diaspora. And I don't think it's a, you know, one versus the other. I consider myself both an Afrofuturist and African futurist. Um, I guess it just depends on how the individual um, defines it for themselves. But yeah, the term is, you know, specifically centering, you know, marginalized writers from the continent who you know, don't necessarily have, you know, access to big publishing industry, you know, to the editors uh, and that sort of thing. Okay, okay. Uh, I hope you guys can still hear me. Yeah, okay. I wanted to go last because my, my viewpoint might be <laughs> somewhat contrarian, you know, my, yeah, my, my generate a lot of disagreements. Yeah. Okay, so I think that I want to say the thing that everybody thinks, but they rarely say. I, I think that um, Lisa, um, she said she's both, or she believes in both African futurism and Afrofuturism. And I feel like that's because the overlap is so immense that it's very difficult, practically impossible to only be a proponent or a part of one. As a matter of fact, they're kind of the same thing, you know? It's just a matter of execution. Mm -hmm. And if we're, if we're going to be realistic, if we're going to look at the reality of the field, because these terms are not just academic, they're supposed to interact with us in the real world. If we look at how we, they interact in the real world, they're actually the same thing. They're supposed to be the same based on, um, you know, um, um, execution. They're supposed to be different in execution, but in reality, they are the same. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Afro, it's like LP Kindred said, African futurism is supposed to have um, a less diverse proximity from the West, right? So it's supposed to center African writers more on the continent more thoroughly. Well, the argument or the supposed shortcomings of Afrofuturism is that it, it, um, it centers the West more and it's a little bit more divorced from, um, you know, African writers on the continent. But those, those are just definitions. In reality, lots of Africans on the continent, like Lisa, like um, Shingai, like I could list, I could go on and on, identify with Afrofuturism. They feel centered if you ask them. Me personally, I've lived in the continent all my life. This is literally the first time I got on a local, I got on a plane in my life. But you know what? I identify with a lot of Afrofuturists. I've worked with them. I feel centered by them. I have a book with Sherry Rene Thomas. You know, she's, she's literally a legend. She's a pioneer. She worked with Samuel Delany, W.E. Dubois. I have a book with her. How much more centered can you be than that? She literally gave me her name, you know, her, her goddess ass name to work with, you know. Tanarai Du was on the cover was on the introduction of my anthology, the um, Dominion anthology, right? And I was, that was my first ever anthology. I was literally a nobody. I didn't exist. I didn't know her. I literally just slid into her DM and said, hey, ma'am, I'm so, 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 and so I'm an African editor. I would like to do a book. Can you jump on? You know who else, Tanana Wright, you has been on their introduction? Jordan Peele some of the most important people you can think of. And she did that. So as far as I'm concerned, Afrofuturism in effect centers Africa just as much as African futurism does. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I know what the definitions are supposed to do, but definitions don't create the thing. They require work. And right now, in this moment in time, either because it's too young or the work hasn't been done, but African futurism does not center African writers on the continent any more than Afrofuturism does. If it aims to solve the problem, that's a future aim. It hasn't happened yet. There's going to be a lot of work. I'm not criticizing the label. It's a cool idea. If you feel something is not enough and you want to do more, that's, that's cool. But you know, it should actually be done. So yeah, that's my two cents on it. Great. Uh, that gives us, I think, a, a really good sort of starting place. Uh, right, we're all, all sort of coming from, from the same perspective and understanding on the difference between those terms and, and clearly the similarities. Um, so let's move on then um, and talk about climate fiction a little bit. Um, and there seems to be um, a lot, some, something of, of a surge of climate fiction coming out of Africa specifically, or generally, I suppose, uh, more specifically, at least from, from what I've been seeing, um, uh, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Ghana, um, and some, some other African countries as well. Um, and Solar Magazine in particular, we were sort of regularly receiving um, really great stories and, and publishing stories by, uh, by authors um, from various African countries. Um, so I'm curious, and, and uh, maybe Ogun Chabwe is, is a good person to start with this, um, but what do you think is driving this trend? Um, do you see a lot of climate fiction um, in your own editorial work? Um, yeah, or, yeah, I do. I do, I do. It's a, there's been a lot of climate fiction in like in every African, pub, most African publications I'm aware of, for Men and a Magazine. I had some in my year's best African speculative fiction anthology. There are several in the um, Africa region anthology, so much that it almost becomes, you know, repetitive. But, you know, the thing, the thing is, I feel like white why that's not a bad thing, you know, sometimes we feel like repetition is bad. If everybody's doing the same thing, it's wrong, you know. For example, recently there's been a push for more lighter um, speculative fiction from the continent, happy SFF, you know, because there's too much dark stuff coming out. But that's the thing, the kind of literature that is out there is shaped by people, is shaped by their experiences. If there's a lot of something, it's because people are feeling a lot of that thing. You know, there's a lot of darkness happening on the continent. You know, there's a lot of poverty. Africa has a lot of history of, you know, of bad things happening, slavery, colonialism, which hasn't been dealt with. So, you know, the, the dark, the dark, the unhappy, the, the, there's a reason why you can't change it by creating more happy submission windows. If people want to write that, you know, it's the same thing with climate fiction. There's a lot, you know, the world, climate fiction is a real thing. There are like lots of, lots of millions of people displaced in Nigeria. Lots of cities are drowning. I kid you not, you know, I post about it on my timeline all the lot, um, all the time. There's, you know, what's happening all over the world right now, hurricanes, you know, on the continent specifically is worse. Everything is worse on the continent because people are less prepared, less able to deal with things. You know, the pandemic was worse. Economic wars were worse. Everything is, you know, because resources, because, you know, marginalization. So climate fiction, affects people on the continent much more you know there's lot there, there's less resources to deal with it there's less healthcare there's less emergency response there's less solid infrastructure to deal with flooding so people are writing what they fear and they're writing what they feel which is what i feel is the reason for lots of you know the climate fiction coming out of the continent. I mean, I've written one myself, my Nebula award-winning um, story. Yeah, Otu Arena. So yeah. Yeah, I'd like to um, add on to that, that, you know, we often talk about, you know, climate disaster is something that's coming in the future. 
that's not here, that's this dystopian future, but you know, for a lot of black and brown communities, it's already here. Um, you know, drought, water scarcity, flooding, you know, that's already here and it's not some dystopian future. Uh, for example, in my collection, I have a story about water scarcity that's, you know, based on uh, real events. So I think the reason for the surge is that we're having these uh, African writers who are just rendering reality, but uh, speculatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the West, it's, it's really uh, <laughs> interesting that like the rest of the world is in, is in climate disaster and like, I know at least in the States, people are just like, nothing's happening while, you know, um, there was a hurricane sighting off the coast of California recently. Hurricanes don't happen in this region, but, uh, but this is something that's not new for everyone else in the world. So at least I know in the States, it's going to take a while for people to catch up and understand like, oh, this is happening. We're still having arguments about whether climate change is occurring in this country. So uh, uh, so the idea that it's it's occurring, that it's showing up a lot in fiction, in places where people are actually dealing with the consequences of the rapid, the ramp, rampant, sorry, uh, consumerism in places like the States and Europe, it, it makes perfect sense. And that's how, how you see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird too. I mean, there's tons of climate just denial here in the, I mean, you know, I mean, because I think we see we see the effects of climate change here and climate disaster, right? I mean, there was just a hurricane uh, in the southeast, right? Fires all summer long, all over the western United States, and it's a regular, regular thing. Um, for whatever reason, it's just you know, it's the United States is sort of unique that way, and has been for for quite some time. Um, you know, just that there's just so many people who adamantly deny um climate change and its impacts but um okay great so then let's move on uh so um, uh in there's this uh great article um from back in 2019 that Krisca Desir wrote uh, proposing uh, afrofuturism as a solution to the global crisis of climate change um, and rampant white supremacy uh, and so, and, 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 you know, I, uh, we, it, we're at, like at solar punk magazine, we, we are sort of fond of saying that, um, um, you know, that, that, that solar punk and literature in general can really have a, a profound impact on, on people and, and people's lives in, in the real world. Um, and, and so this idea of Afrofuturism as, uh, and, uh, not just, um, a way for us to sort of frame things, but as an actual solution to these crises um, really sort of struck me. So I'm curious what you all think about how um, Afrofuturism or what African futurism or just black stories and literature in general um, as art and as literary genre can, can play this role uh, as an actual solution to um, crises like climate change, white supremacy, colonialism, et cetera. Uh, anyone who wants to, to start, go ahead and just jump in. I can jump in, that's cool, right? Sure. Right, right. Great. Um, I think a lot of uh, conversations about uh, indigenous futurisms, um, part of it is rejecting the aspect of, of blackness or brownness that has been uh, suppressed by colonialism been uh, suppressed by uh, the empire essentially. So like uh, these things that we've been forced to forget in order to exist in, in, in conversation with, or in, in my case, in the West, uh, returning to a lot of the things that, that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the ways that were sustainable that made the world work without necessarily mass producing a thing so that another continent can, can experience it. Um, I think that's central to the way that Afrofuturism and African futurism potentially uh, imagine a future that will survive. Um, because the West is so very concerned with individualism and not about collectivism and how we're all going to make it, just how one person can make it and uh, one person can get there by themselves and they don't need anybody. And that's not real. And that's not, uh, it's kind of a, a fictive mindset that 
has no bearing on how we can all move forward because no one's going to survive this by themselves. Um, I think that's one of the ways in which Afrofuturism can imagine a world that makes it out alive. But rejecting the West is really hard because the West is, and white supremacy are so ingrained in everything that they touch. Yeah, LP, I like the way you kept on using, you know, the word, uh, you know, imagine, imagination. I think there's something, you know, radical about imagining a different future. And I think world leaders right now and institutions are kind of plagued by a lack of imagination that, you know, we can't do anything about, uh, you know, these climate disasters. Um, so for me, Afrofuturism is about kind of like this radical imagination, radical change and abolition. abolition. I like to think of, uh, historical figures like Harriet Tubman as Afrofuturist, because she could imagine uh, a future where Black people were free. At the time, that was an impossibility. Um, so that, you know, imagination, everything starts with imagining. And then first, when you've had that imagination, then second, you can begin the work. Um, so I think Afrofuturism, you know, is about, you know, that imagination, imagining a different world, so that the next step is putting in the work uh, to bring about that world. All right. Um, okay. Uh, well, for me, um, it starts with science fiction. The general, one of the general things science fiction does, we always talk about it predicts the future. But another thing it does, it's like creates the future. It modifies the future. You know, a lot of people, they, there's this article done by Oleta Labi. I can't remember where, but he was talking about how a lot of people who go into astronomy, into STEM, you know, a lot of um, women are, and people generally are influenced by science fiction. You know, you read this genius, this story with this genius character you like as a young kid and, you know, you there's a connection, there's a line between, you know, what you see and, you know, what's put in front of you and what you become, you know. So it's not only with media or advertising, it's also with literature. We can influence or create the future with literature. So it's the same thing with Afrofuturism. It guides how, you know, the future, it guides the future of black people, you know, all the kinds of black descended futurisms, Afro-African, you know, putting people in certain positions as heroes, as scientists, you know, look at um, Shireen, Black Panther as, you know, whatever they are, you know, it, 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 it gives people that dream, you know, Black people, Africans, that they can be these things, you know. It also helps not just us, but it also helps the rest of the world to see us in those positions, you know. And if you can see somebody in a position, then you can give them room to be in that position. You know, you, you'd be surprised at the level of um, ignorance, you know, if you, if you, that's if you're being benevolent, or we can just call it racism that a lot of people have, benevolent racism. They don't see Africans, they don't see Black people. I mean, in a lot of positions, every time someone black or African does something spectacular, there's an excuse for why it happened. They cheated, it was the wind, you know, the Nigerian girl that broke the world record. They literally said it was the wind. And I'm wondering, is she an airbender? They said it was the wind. They said it was her shoes. You know, they had to verify several times. You know, the Nigerian basketball team beat the US team recently it was the first African team to beat the US team. They said, you know, it was their names. Like how can, you know, they, how can they have such weird names like Namdi? I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. Like a, a literal like um, sports commentator, Stephen Smith said that on live TV, you know. So a lot of people have a hard time believing that, you know, Africans can, uh, black people can be important, can do things, you know. So Afrofuturism corrects this very erroneous um, idea, you know, and, uh, you know, things like, yeah, Black Panther, things like all the, all the works of literature that you can imagine, you know, that paint us as doing things. Yeah, I believe that they help to correct 
everything and this includes you know real world issues like um you know climate change and everything else that you can think of so yeah I want to come back in because I love I love that conversation because you know he's like oh you know humans could never have built the pyramids because you know blah 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 I was like but on the continent mathematics wasn't new or news so the idea that like people couldn't do things that people that people that you know our our, our palm skin friends couldn't uh, couldn't imagine possible uh, like. Get over yourself like just because you can't see black people figuring it out doesn't mean that they didn't or that we didn't have maths or history or philosophy or astronomy like centuries before they really developed in europe um yeah i really love that point the point he made not the point i made <laughs> oh, oh yeah um, i want to add something i want to jump back in it on the dichotomy between Afro and African futurism, you know, like I was saying, voices on the continent agree they are extra marginalized because, you know, uh, Black people outside the continent have proximity. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, they're perfect. You know, they also have, you know, a lot of issues like, you know, being, but I feel like Black people on the continent are more marginalized in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economics, in terms of, you know, so there's this push to center, you know, things on the continent because voices are less heard, you know, and all that. And I, and I feel like that centering work, it, it has to happen by practical solutions not just by labels. I'm not saying labels are not important. Yes, by labels, but not just by labels. And probably not firstly by labels, but by practical solutions. How do I mean? Are you paying writers on the continent? Are you publishing them? That's what centering means. Are you publishing them? Are you paying them? Are they getting agents? Are you adapting their works? That's what centering means. It's not just flinging. So, 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 you know, that's why I put a lot of stock. I put a lot of weight in Afrofuturism. It's doing the work. Look at LP Kindred, Lisa, and Shane Guy. Look at Voodoo Knots. You know, they've had workshops. They've had, you know, collections. They've had anthologies. They've published writers. They've paid them. They've promoted them. They've put their works out there. You know, I mentioned Sherry and um, um, Turn and Arrive Due the other time. It wasn't just about what they did for me. It's about what they do for the continent. Because <laughs> Dominion Anthology and Africa Racing weren't just for me. There are dozens, you know, with, with, with collaborating with Afrofuturists, my, personally, I've published and paid over 100 writers most of them on the continent, you know, the Africa Region Anthology has more African writers than any other place, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah, so my, my, my point is that on the difference, I would say that um, the, the focus should be on, you know, how we center them, not just on, oh, there's this and there's this. So, I think we should focus more on the work than on just, you know, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what I think. And on just the academics, on, on just the definitions, yeah. I have more to say, but I'm gonna hold off. Are you sure? You're welcome to say it. You can't get an introvert microphone. Uh, extra very microphone. Uh, so yeah, I think one of the things that 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 Afrofuturism, I think that dichotomy between Afrofuturism and African futurism can be so frustrating because it, it kind of ignores that 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 black people in anglophone states, anglophones, uh, black people with proximity to to publishing as we think about it. So uh, black Americans, black Brits, you know, um we struggle to get placed as well 
right? And so it, it can seem like, oh, there's just this preponderance of, of, of Black writers who have access to these things, and then people on the continent don't have access to it because, you know, they're not on this continent or, or in Europe, uh, which is super frustrating because sometimes it seems like from the outside looking in, folks think that we have, uh, we definitely have an easier time getting to publishing than people in Africa do. But the struggle is that like, we run against people with an inability to recognize what we're doing, that, that we're writing things that are black. And so what the conversation becomes, oh, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't relate to this character or, you know, um, could you put this in a context that I understand? And it, it cracks me up because I always use Shakespeare. Because whenever I've read Shakespeare, there's been, notes on the side to explain what the hell is being said because we don't speak that kind of English anymore. Um, and as a Black person who reads, I've spent my entire life projecting myself into white shoes so that I can understand what's going on in a book. Um, and if you are a white person, you might have never had the, the need to try to empathize with a Black character or you can just get away with saying, oh, you know, I, you know, it just didn't hit for me. And because it didn't hit for me, I'm not going to read it further. I'm not going to publish it. And so you add on to that being from a continent, from a, from a community, from a culture that isn't in conversation with the West in the same way that, I, that mine is because I'm from Chicago. You know what I'm saying? And so there are the, these successive barriers for African writers to to get published in the States. And I think, or to get published globally, I should say. And so I think in that way, African futurism is really important, um, but uh, it, 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 it's, it still remains, it, it's still hard for me and Yvette to get- uh, Yeah, definitely, definitely. Writers in the anthologies. Yeah, definitely. How was I agreeing with you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, I start what I was saying by saying that obviously all black people are marginalized. I mean, no, nobody thinks like you. You only have to look at the news to like understand that you know, uh, yeah, black people in abroad don't have it. Um, you know, rosy or perfect. You know, so yeah, I I acknowledge what you're saying. Marginalization definitely is is a it's, it's a universal thing for black people, you know, it's, it's, you know, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So yeah, yeah, valid. It's just, it just comes in different flavors, you know, and sometimes there's this argument of which one is worse or which one is, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the suffering Olympics, but I think we should just focus on rising together. You know, there's a lot that we can do. You know, look look at you and um, Lisa and Chinga. You know, there's a lot that we can do together. Look at me and Zelda and Sherry. You know, I feel like the 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 joint projects that we do together, like they are more nuanced, they are more complete than the projects that we do separately. You know, so I feel like we should work on creating more collaborations. You know, instead of just um, labels, you know, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. So, well, let's uh, turn the conversation a little bit um, to to you all personally as as writers. Uh, I'm curious if your own writing at all in the past or currently. Um, has or does touch on or or get into climate fiction? Are you writing climate fiction yourself, or or do issues uh, and themes uh, uh, that are common to climate fiction find themselves working their way into your writing? Um, let's uh, start with Yvette. Um, yeah, I have a, a forthcoming short story collection called "Drinking from Graveyard Wells." And they have a story called Water Bites Back um, that's about black mermaids trying to save the environment by taking on these corrupt politicians. And uh, in that story, I'm engaging with the Southern African philosophy of Ubuntu, which is collectivism, um, sometimes uh, translated as I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. So how can we collectively um, 
work together um, to save the environment. And then uh, I also have another story uh, which deals with water sc scarcity and the consequences uh, of that on a community uh, where, and it's also based on uh, real events that happened in Zimbabwe, a community didn't have access uh, to water due to droughts and poor governance, and they had to dig a well in a graveyard. Uh, and so I kind of take that situation and kind of look at like, what are the consequences of that? Houses in that neighborhood start, you know, disappearing uh, because of that. Uh, so I'm using this like conceit of disappearing houses and this spooky graveyard to talk about water scarcity and uh, droughts and uh, poor uh, governance and the marginalized communities that are impacted uh, by those things. So that's uh, Drinking from Graveyard Wells, which is available for pre-order now, and it's coming out uh, early next March. There's also a link in the chat, go ahead. What was that? Sorry, LP, I missed what you said. There's also a link in the chat, go ahead and pre-order. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, yeah, there's a few links in the uh, chat okay. here. I um, think you're, you're posting to the panelists. I don't think you're, you're, you're sharing with like everybody. Nice. Uh, yeah, so you might want to check that. Oh yeah, make sure that you've got everyone selected instead of a, a specific person. Uh, oh, it, doesn't, it doesn't give the option for showing to the, the audience, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, weird. Um, well, if you want to, to type it to me, I, then I can, uh, I can throw it in the chat to everyone. We can sort of do a relay race. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I think I can do it. So I'll just copy and paste uh, what you did. Oh, oh great. Um, yeah, uh, and then same, uh, I'll, get, I'll make sure these other links get thrown uh, out there for folks. Um, okay, uh, uh, Ogunachobe, how about you? Uh, any, are you writing any climate fiction? Have, or have you in the past, uh, any, any works that, uh, you have forthcoming that are, are related to climate fiction? Okay, uh, there's the, um, okay, I actually also only have, um, hosts and panelists. Okay, okay. Anyways, um, yeah, I have, um, Africa Reason, which is coming out in November. Uh, I'll share the link to download the pre-order. Um, yeah, uh, both Shingai and Yvette are on it. There are, lo there are lots of um, climate fiction stories, Afrofuturism, African futurism, climate fiction dealing with, you know, writers on and off the continent, several, you know. Uh, yeah, let me let me share the link here. Um, yeah, uh, share the link. There's also my um, Nebula Award winning story, O2 Arena, on um, Galaxy's Edge. So you can also check that out. It won the Nebula Award, and it's a finalist in the. Um, it's a finalist in the in the BFA, the BSFA, the a bunch of awards. I, I can't remember. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there's Oto Arena. I also have another story, Destiny Delete. Um, it's not climate fiction, but it's set in Lagos, which is you know de facto climate fiction. We always joke about how um, Lagos might get swallowed up by the ocean very soon. Um, yeah, it has a lot of issues as well. So, yeah, yeah, that's it for me. I have some kind of fiction that's kind of in the works uh, for myself personally, but like I think most of what you're going to see is coming from. Um, who did not present real living mythology, uh, which uh, Yvette Shingai um, and Hugh and I co-edited, uh, which is coming out for Android Press also in November. Can we talk about how November is gonna be the blackest speculativist month <laughs> like that we've seen in a long time because Africa Risen is coming, um, uh, Reliving Mythology is coming, 
Q uh, has uh, Futureland coming out. N.K. Jemison has uh, the second book in the Great Cities trilogy, uh, duology. I think there's two more that, that I can't think of off the top of my head, but like, it's going to be very black. I'm going to be very behind. Please don't ask me for anything. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a good month. Well, and, and speaking of the Voodoo Nuts Presents Reliving Mythology anthology, uh, one of the questions that has come through the chat here um, or the Q&A function um, is, is about that anthology and uh, a Bright Flame was wondering if uh, LP and Yvette, you all could give us uh, a, a short preview of just kind of the range of stories that are included in the anthology. Yeah, do you want to take it, LP? Nope, or we're going to do this together. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I just wanted to read the uh, back cover copy, if that's all right, because that has uh, some of the stories. Um, when a desperately She's mundane smart. woman borrows clothing from her mother, a sukuyant goes searching for her skin. A Nigerian parent climbs mountains to heaven to steal a name and glorious destiny for their newborn. A master tailor gets her skills tested when a, spec uh, when a spectral customer enters her workshop and, and she can't say no. A preacher casts dark magic from his pulpit when the word ain't enough to run his church. These tales and more populate Burunas Presents Reliving Mythology, called from the imaginations of its inaugural fellows and a handful of solicited authors, including Christopher Cadwell, T.L. Huchu, Aidan Royce, and Burunas uh, create, curates a uh, coterie of short fiction and poetry that paints across the breadth of magic and blackness. Co-editors and founders Shingai and Jerry Kakunda, Iveli Sandlovu, Yu Hunter, and LP Kindred ask Black writers to interrogate their mythologies, folklore, superstition, and wife's tale to create the book within your hands. I'm so glad you thought to read that because I'd have been like just trying to come up with like some, uh, <laughs> how do I distill the story really quickly after not thinking about it for a little bit? Yeah, that was great. I like that. Yeah, that, that worked well. Um, okay, uh, so then uh, another question that came in from uh, Selena Middleton from uh, Stella Forum Press. Um, and she uh, is curious, having read the Dominion anthology um, and really sort of enjoyed stretching her mind around the kind of non-Western story structures um, that you get throughout the anthology. Um, she's curious if those, uh, those sort of story elements and structures um that are are sort of uncommon here in the west position afrofuturism and african futurism um to, to uh, better address issues of climate change that also um sort of fall into into that same category of um people not really in the west uh, getting it or or caring does, does that make sense Yes, it makes sense. And and yes, it does. Next question. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I think I think there's a way there's I think that there's a way that the story is taught in the West, which um uh, which uh creates a barrier to everyone else <laughs> in that like uh we talk about 3x structure and we talk about uh the hero's journey and Freytex pyramid and like blah 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 blah. And there's a way there are ways that are are oral or colloquial that we tell stories that because of how we're taught about story in the West, like they don't, um, we, we, when we see them committed to page, we look at them and say, oh, this doesn't make sense. That's not a story. Um, and I think that in those ways, Afrofuturism and I think African futurism as well as like a lot of other indigenous futurisms, because they force a reader to think about story differently, they can force a culture to think about the experiences that it's having differently. Uh, but again, you know, white supremacy is white supremacy. And so there is a pushback against that. Like the idea that magical realism is a, a Latin phenomenon is, is very big, but there's also a version of it where magical realism is a response to the empire and colonialism. 
uh, saying that the way that you are, the way that you have been, does not work with, does not interface well with, with the West's idea of what reality is. You know, people have had magic. We didn't call it magic because that was just our life. And then you have the West come in and was like, oh, you know, that's, that's savage, that's ridiculous. But I have a Bible and all these stories with things that happen that we, we, we hold as truths and self-evident, but we can't see that for black and brown people. So I think, I think just the nature of writing things that don't, that push against what we think of as stories as Westerners uh, opens our minds to the possibilities that, that exist um, despite the fact that people are not seeing possibilities because they can't read black people and brown people. But that's another conversation that I'll go into on Twitter. Yeah, uh, I wanna add um, to that, um, particularly to the question of African story structures. So I have an essay uh, coming out this month, I believe from uh, Fantasy Magazine, which um, looks at uh, African story structures, in particular the Ngano uh, structure from my home country, Zimbabwe. In that essay, I kind of break down the elements of Ngano, and some of those elements include Afro-surrealism, the use of Ubuntu, which is collectivism, like I was talking about. So, you know, thinking, you know, thinking about, you know, climate change and climate activism, how it is collectivism and not individualism that will get us there. And, you know, and the use of other elements. Uh, and I give examples of stories and novels that use uh, these, uh, these elements um, in their work, uh, including uh, my own. So yeah, I'll give that a look. Uh, I think it's coming out this month. I believe I'll double check that. And yeah, I'm, I'm breaking down the structure and what are the elements um, that go into that structure. And just follow Yvette. Just follow Yvette and make sure that you don't miss anything, okay? Because I didn't know anything Thing about this and I talk to her every day okay you might f around and find out there you go <laughs> okay I'll just chip in and say that uh, it goes beyond storytelling structures and it seeps into language you know for example your identity is in your language in Nigeria for example if I wanted to say if I wanted to use a simile for tall I would say as tall as an Iroko tree and the average white person doesn't know what an Iroko tree is, doesn't have any idea. So my writing is going to be peppered with little bits of flex of my identity, my culture, my location. And those things, they add up. You know, so when you're looking at a book of 200,000 words, maybe 40,000 words of it are my culture which is foreign, which is being read by people who are not used to, you know, going outside their culture. So it comes across as strange, you know, if you read the, the that's what people need to understand. Like writing your language, your culture is in your language, your identity is in your language. So people read a lot of African and black stories and they are not used to allowing you know, the existence of all these identities in the language. So they feel like it's bad. You know, recently in the US, I was conversing with someone and they said, oh, that was a very odd phrasing. The way you phrased that, that statement just now, it was odd. And we, look at, we looked at it, we broke it down. And he said, oh, it's technically correct. It's technically correct, but it's odd because it's not how he would phrase it. Do you get, which is essentially what's going on with black and African literature, but blown up. It's, 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 it fails to connect with, you know, a more westernized audience that is not just to looking outside, you know, of itself that subconsciously orders, you know, everything else that is different, you know? So yeah, that sometimes adds to the disconnect. Sorry about that. Was muted. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm done. Uh, I was going to say co-sign with what he said, and you should also follow him because he has a bunch of books coming out as well, where he not just, uh, right now we're talking about what it looks like, but the books that he's editing are all exemplifying what he's, so, you know, we can, we can talk about architecture or you can just read what he's talking about. And I think 
I think the second one will get you a lot, a lot farther. Not to say that you're not clear, but I'm saying like invest in it. It's not, it's not enough to listen to people talk about these things. To go out and read these books. All of them. Yeah, there are lots of links. We've dropped a lot of links. Yeah. Great. Google it, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Google is it should be everybody's friend. Um, okay, well, we've got we've got a few minutes left, it looks like. Um, so let's uh let's go with a sort of a fun question uh and, and kind of getting back to um your your personal writing um what uh, i guess what are your favorite themes symbols and motifs that you tend to work into your writing uh, and this question comes from brianna castagnazzi uh i'm gonna show away you want to go first yeah for me it's, uh, my stories are usually dark dystopian because they contain bits of my reality uh nigeria is <laughs> Funny enough, this is our Independence Day. And if you go out there, you see everybody saying how, no, we don't feel independent. We're not happy. Don't say happy independence, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> a lot of my stories touch on the dark, the dystopian, the broken. They also touch on power a lot, you know, power, absence of power, you know, the means by which people go to obtain it, the uses they put it, the consequences of that lack and you know stuff like that. And all the other little things that come up come with it. I, I have an essay on, on Candy magazine, this September October issue is titled um, Too Dystopian for Whom a Continental Nigerian Writer's Perspective. So you can check it out as well. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, uh, symbols, motifs, and themes that you find yourself commonly working into your writing. Uh, there's a lot of death in my writing, but it's not necessarily sad. Um, uh, I'm, I'm seem to be very obsessed with like death uh rebirth and mourning and what it means to let go of a, a person or an experience or a way of being um and you'll see that in uh you're over is here or open 27 hours which are two stories that came out in 2020 uh that i'm super proud of um you also get a lot of food there are a lot of celebrations around food in my stories um I think the best compliment that I keep getting is uh, I finished your story and I was hungry. I'm like, yeah, I did that. I love that. Yeah, you should all listen to um, LP Crindard's um, story read by LaVar Burton. Uh, your rover is here. He does an excellent job of rendering the characters. Um, uh, in my work, I work with a lot of uh, afro uh in particular exploring uh, the absurdity and surreal experience of being a Black person in this world. For example, uh, in my forthcoming uh, collection, Drinking from Graveyard Wells, African heads of state are immortal beings who you know, hold on to the seat of power forever. You have um, immigrant women uh, immigrating to an American-like state where you have to, uh, a state that demands the toll of the thing that you love the most to be allowed to stay. There's commentary on immigration um, you have uh, gentrification and neo-colonialism neo being explored through, you know, uh, disappearing houses as well as uh, water scarcity and climate disasters. Um, and then you have black tax explored through um, capitalism as, you know, a curse that's, you know, put upon black people by God. So all of these, I just use speculative uh, fiction to explore the real and um, I guess surreal experiences of you know black life uh, on this planet. Great. Um, well we've got just a few minutes left. I think we can squeeze in one one last question uh, if we can keep the answers to just like oh, wow with this question too. I don't know if, if it's fair <laughs> to try and ask anyone to keep the answers short. Um, but Stephen Gonzalez points out um, that there's, you know, whether it's unconscious or not, 
um, you know, obviously biased towards European styles of storytelling for editors. Um, you guys uh, mentioned at, at one point in the conversation the sort of the the uh, in, the uh, increased difficulty that Black authors in general, the African authors, have getting their stories published. Um, so the the question is is um, what do you think editors can do to sort of broaden their understanding of of what is uh, what's a good story um, and uh, to you know to sort of better reflect literary traditions outside of the West in publications. Fucking read, just read yeah. people who do not come. Read people who are Latine, read people who are Southeast Asian, uh, East Asian, African, uh, African diaspora. That just just read things that, that are not canon for where you live, and you'll you'll start to pick it up. It will it will feel less alien, it will feel less foreign. Um, the hard part about that for a lot of people, for a lot of editors, is that if you are a slush reader. If you are an editor of a magazine, if you are editing at a uh, at a at a press, if you are an agent, you're already reading a lot, and so what you're what you're losing is what you're gaining is a confirmation bias. So, like I've read all of the canon for you know America and Britain, and so when I read these stories by Black and Brown people, they don't they don't compute. Uh, I'm already reading a lot, so I can't read more. And I'm like, I challenge you to, I challenge everyone to to get themselves a nice black and brown uh, reading challenge so they can figure out how to service the stories that don't fit. Uh, Yvette, you did, a, you did a reading challenge, didn't you? Where you started with, uh, where you read all African, um, all books by African writers uh, starting at the end because you wanted to read Zimbabwe first. Uh, but like going in reverse alphabetical order and like fucking amazing. Like it's, 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 a, it's, I'm not gonna say it's easy to do but it's something that's very doable in a couple of years. So mm -hmm. read, read like you give a fuck about the rest of the world. Yeah, that's a great answer. Any, anyone wanna add to it in the last minute we have? No, that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, yeah, I mean, so for folks in the audience, there's, you know, there's lots of links that have been thrown out um, that can help you do just that. Um, if nothing else, pick up uh, Drinking from Graveyard Wells, uh, go find LP Kindred's stories, or pick up uh, one of the uh, African speculative fiction anthologies. Dominion, any of any of the if other the Bridger uh, Worlds, I posted yeah. is free. It's literally Sorry. free. The Bridger Worlds Anthology. Oh, I shared the link. It's free. So you can just you don't even have to buy it. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, that does it for our time. Uh thank you to all of the panelists, Yvette LP, Ogunachobe. Um, really Disappointed and sorry that um, we were not able to figure out what is up with uh, Aubriana, who was supposed to be moderating the panel. Um, but uh, it was a, a great conversation anyway. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you, thank all, all three of you for, for being here and sharing your, your knowledge and your wisdom and uh, your passion with us. All right. Have a good day, everybody. See you in the other sessions. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Thank yeah, you. Bye. bye.